My name is William Galston. Miriam Galston and I um, have the privilege of serving as the American organizers of the annual Hartford's Complete Philosophy Conference, which is meeting here for the 26th time. And on behalf of the conference, and of course the Hartford Institute, let me welcome you to this beautiful Bolt Institute Garage for the Robert P. Kogar Annual Lecture. Uh, this lecture, as you can tell, is named in honor of Bob Kogod, who couldn't be here tonight because he's on the World Board, which is meeting tonight. Uh, but if you want to see his works, look around you. He is substantially responsible for the existence of this gorgeous and, and, you know, and amazingly vital facility. The topic of this year's conference is the challenges of sovereignty in a Jewish state. And so it's appropriate that this year's Kogod Lecture will focus on that theme as well. And our lecturer is an especially appropriate choice. Uh, he is, as was advertised, uh, Sanford Levinson. And he has been a member of the annual philosophy conference from the very beginning. He was present at the creation. And as he acknowledges in his work subsequently, this encounter between an American academic and the Jewish tradition has been enormously fruitful for him and through his work, enormously fruitful for the rest of us as well. Uh, but there are 51 other weeks in the year, and in those weeks, uh, he holds a chair at the University of Texas Law School, where he's also a professor of government. Uh, he's the author of five books, two most recent, increasingly fervent denunciations of the U.S. Constitution and a plea for wholesale revision and hundreds of articles on constitutional law and related topics. He was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2001, and his topic tonight is Divided Loyalties, the Problem of Dual Sovereignty and Constitutional Faith. And as the commentator on his talk, we are really lucky to have Suzanne Last Stone. Uh, she is the University Professor of Jewish Law and Contemporary Civilization at Yeshiva University, and also a professor of law and the director of the Center for Jewish Law and Contemporary Civilization at Cardozo Law School. She is very widely published in Jewish thought and in legal theory. She's on the editorial board of numerous journals in the United States and also here in Israel. And in 2010, she was invited to deliver the Franz Rosenzweig Lectures on Religious Thought at Yale University, a very, very distinguished lecture opportunity. If all goes according to plan, after the lecture and the commentary, we'll have about 30 minutes for questions and discussion, which I will moderate with a firm hand. And with that, and an outstretched arm, and with that, Sandy Levis. Thank you. It is a great honor, but also a daunting challenge, to have been asked to deliver the Kogat Lecture. That it is a great honor is obvious. I will remember many previous lectures by distinguished predecessors. That it is also daunting comes from the fact that I am scarcely an expert in Jewish law. I treasure my now over quarter century affiliation with the Mahon for what it has taught me about various aspects of Jewish law. But becoming more knowledgeable does not transform one into an expert. Indeed, my immense gratitude to David Hartman and his colleagues over the years is based on the fact that I have so much to learn and they have so much to teach me. It would therefore be foolish in the extreme to attempt to talk, particularly in Jerusalem, offering an intricate analysis of a particular problem in Jewish law. What I shall do instead is to elaborate some of the ways that my thought has been affected by my joint study of an intellectual confrontation 
with Jewish law and American constitutional law. After completing my PhD, I went to law school where I had an epiphany about the role played by the United States Constitution within American civil religion. Whether or not all states have such religions, as Rousseau suggested, and as I suspect is the case, it is certainly the case that no one could possibly understand the United States without paying attention to certain central myths and symbols that help constitute what it means to be distinctively American. Given the sheer diversity of the various groups that settled what became the United States, and as much to the point came to the United States afterward, many analysts have described the country as depending for what unity it has on what American naturalization law has called attachment to the principles of the Constitution. It should be obvious that such an attachment did not prevent the United States from entering into an extraordinary bloody civil war that killed around 750,000 persons, uh, roughly 25 to 3% of the total population. More to the point, perhaps, is that it is tendentious to declare that Southern secessionists striving to preserve slavery were less attached to the Constitution than their Northern opponents committed to the preservation of the Union inasmuch as the constitutional debate was precisely whether the Constitution correctly understood allowed secession should particular parties to the constitutional agreement believe that it was not being faithfully implemented. Uh, um, in, a, in a new book that I've just published, I've distinguished rather sharply between what I have taken to calling constitutions of settlement, uh, the paradigm example of which is Inauguration Day, um, which is settled by the 20th Amendment, and except in fairly exotic discussions, there's no real debate on when January 20th occurs. Uh, but complementing the Constitution of Settlement, <clears throat> and I've also come to believe, incidentally, that Constitution of Settlement are extraordinarily important, much more important than most law professors believe, because we obsess only and exclusively on the second Constitution, which is what I've taken to calling the Constitution of Conversation. That is the Constitution that is litigated, precisely because of a reading of the text will in no way bring us to a unanimous conclusion on what the text means. So, from my perspective, secession is um, an ideal or a grim example of the constitution of conversation within the United States. And I think that all constitutions in all countries have that mixture. And we kid ourselves if we believe that constitutions will necessarily bring concord. <laughs> in any case, in thinking about how we might identify such attachment, it struck me that there might be helpful analogies to be drawn between our approaches to the Constitution and those taken by more standard form religions to their fundamental documents, whether the Torah, the Christian scriptures, or the Koran. After all, all are importantly text-based in some substantial sense, even if all can equally be analyzed in terms of the validity they credit to oral traditions or commentaries on the initial text. All of these religions, including the civil religion of constitutionalism, require defining the proper relationship between written texts and unwritten traditions, not to mention the equally volatile question of deciding who, if anyone, has the authority to offer binding answers to disputes about constitutional meaning. Do we, for example, look to Roman Catholicism as setting a desirable model of institutional authority centered on an ultimately infallible pope? Or are we attracted to a far more pluralistic image of authority 
which by definition means that there is no truly supreme court of adjudication, but in keeping with the theme of our conference, that doesn't mean one escapes at least two issues of sovereignty. One, the purported sovereignty of a constitution, orator, or whatever, but secondly, the de facto sovereignty of those who claim the authority to offer definitive interpretations of an authority that has been claimed with special flamboyance by the Supreme Court of the United States over the last 50 years, um, uh, which is a very controversial uh, claim, incidentally. I, for one, don't accept it, um, but the Supreme Court certainly accepts its own view of supremacy. Moreover, one reality of a civil religion, to the extent that it focuses on sacred texts like declarations of independence or constitutions, Israel obviously has one, but not the other, at least in the traditional sense, is that these texts are the object of special veneration, usually linked to a notion of origins in divine revelation or in acts by demigod-like founders, often capitalized, as in the United States. It obviously remains of significance within Judaism, whether one views the Torah as a distinctly human product or instead something that was importantly delivered at Sinai. Does faith, and just as importantly, the notion of authority, depend on the answer to such questions about origins? In 1986-87, I wrote a book called Constitutional Faith. It was, in some sense, an extended meditation on a statement by a member of Congress from Texas, Barbara Jordan, speaking to the nation from her position as a member of the committee considering the impeachment of Richard Nixon in 1974. Said Jordan, quote, My faith in the Constitution is whole, it is complete, it is total, and I am not going to sit here and be an idle spectator to the diminution, the subversion, the destruction of the Constitution, unquote. I was interested in the use of religious language to describe one's relationship to what is, after all, a secular document. What does it mean to express such a total faith in the Constitution? And why would one have it? Why would it not be regarded as a form of idolatry? Attributing divine-like status to a document written by decidedly imperfect men, not men and women, men, and creating an obviously non-divine, highly imperfect political order. Think only of what Israeli philosopher Avishai Margalit has termed the rotten compromises regarding slavery, a reality of our constitutional history that Representative Jordan, an African American, was clearly aware of. But an important aspect of American political culture is the expression of constitutional faith as the core of American civil religion. Thus, uh, a certain brouhaha was, subject, was generated in the United States earlier this year when Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg went to Cairo and speaking to an audience uh, of young Egyptians about the Arab Spring in that country, uh, admitted that she believed that those looking to draft a new constitution, and surely one of the most interesting constitution drafting projects in the world today, is taking place in Egypt, that they should not look to the United States Constitution because, among other reasons, she said, it's just too old. Her model constitution was the South African Constitution, drafted in 1994. Now, there's actually another feature of her interest. Justice Ginsburg is passionately interested in rights and in human rights about which the United States Constitution has extraordinarily little to say because it was, in fact, drafted in 1787. Um, the South African Constitution is saturated with rights talk. 
Now, my own interest, as I've perhaps already indicated, is increasingly in institutions and the constitution of settlement. Not that I believe that human rights provisions are unimportant. It's simply that I believe we exaggerate their importance and underestimate the importance of institutional features, but as it happens, I agree even more strongly with Justice Ginsburg that no one should look to the United States Constitution for useful guidance on how to structure a polity. Be that as it may, she was condemned by a number of people um, uh, for basically heresy. Um, that a member of the United States Supreme Court would go abroad and suggest that our sacred text was not worth following elsewhere, and implicitly, though she didn't say so, that I'm free to say this, because I'm not on the Supreme Court, that we ought radically to revise it within the United States. But I do think that one can understand at least some of the reaction to Justice Ginsburg's comment um, uh, if one puts it within the civil religious terms. Exaggerated notions of constitutional faith continue to be part, an important part of American political culture. One could easily understand why Samuel G. Friedman, who writes a regular column on religion for the New York Times, wrote very shortly after Election Day in November 2010 of the, quote, religious fervor for the Constitution, unquote, found in many devotees of the so-called Tea Party. He quoted one speaker who regards the Constitution as the product of, quote, divine providence, intuitive intervention, or something like that, unquote, and said, quote, God's words, the concept of godly government, are woven into the warp and woof of the fabric of our nation, and this constitution, it's rightly called the miracle in Philadelphia, unquote. For what it is worth, for those of you who are following the American election, you should be aware uh, that Mitt Romney comes from a religion that has a distinctly theological take on the Constitution. Uh, thus, uh, Ezra Taft Benson, uh, one of the former leaders of the uh, Mormon Church, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, uh, gave a talk a couple of decades ago called Our Divine Constitution, citing some of the sacred texts of that church, uh, one of which is, quote, I establish the constitution of this land, said the Lord, by the hands of wise men whom I raised up to this very purpose. Um, if Governor Romney rejects this view of the constitution, he certainly has not said so. My own view is that any such view of the constitution is out and out dangerous. Um, and I regret very strongly that there seems to be a an accepted convention, at least by the respectable punditry, that it's out of bounds to ask Governor Romney any details about his religious views because religion is assumed by the respectable punditry to be simply a private set of views with no public relevance. But quite frankly, I think one's views of the theological status of the United States Constitution um, is a matter of more than merely uh, pr private interest. Now, why do I think it's so dangerous to have this theologized view of the Constitution? The answer, among other reasons, is that it requires a willful ignorance of the human, all too human origins of the document and the reality that, that like most human political activities, it was attended by often grubby compromises because of what might be described as facts on the ground. There is no reason in the world to describe such compromises, whether one is thinking of slavery um, or equal voting power in the American Senate of each of the states, as capturing admirable truths about politics, beyond, perhaps, the need to engage in what might be awful compromise in order to achieve defensible goals, a theme to which I'll return later in these remarks. 
But there is another reason to think of potential analogs between secular civil religions like American constitutionalism and more traditional religions. And that is the key role that the notion of sovereignty, the talk of our conference, plays in both of them. After all, what Barbara Jordan was evoking was the notion that the Constitution establishes a sovereign authority over all political officials, including the president, within the American political system, and that anyone defying the Constitution, as Nixon did, deserved to be removed from office. Um, indeed, Inauguration Day includes the basically religious ceremony of oath-taking um, and although it's not in the constitutional oath, every American president feels incumbent to conclude the oath-taking by saying, so help me God, uh, as the joinder of church and state in a very important sense. Israel also can contribute its own stories of powerful political figures confronted with the demands of sovereign state law. A key question, though, is whether we feel free to question the justice of particular sovereign laws or instead focus only on the reality of defiance of the laws, whether or not we regard them as altogether defensible. One need not, after all, believe that Yitzhak Rabin committed a gross injustice in having a bank account within the United States in order to believe that he violated Israeli law and perhaps was justly treated in effect being forced out of the prime ministership by Aharon Brock, who was then um, um, the attorney general committed to legal fidelity. The demands made by the state with regard to fidelity to sovereign law pale with regard to demands made by a sovereign God. I know that the Jewish liturgy has formed me in deep ways even if it is principally by providing the set of questions with which I constantly contend and feel disturbed by. Whether paradoxically or not, I get a certain sustenance from renewed confrontation that is absent in a liturgy that attempts to smooth over uh, some of the difficulties presented by Judaism. I want to be reminded every year of Abraham's unjust expulsion of Hagar and then his acquiescence to the even more inexplicable command that he slay Isaac. Why are the traditional readings so powerful? The answer is that both raise clearly and tersely the problem that it should, that should obsess any lawyer or moral philosopher, secular or religious, what is the meaning of sovereignty and what is the relationship between sovereign authority and an individual presumably subject to such authority who nevertheless legitimately believes that the sovereign is commanding what can only be described as perhaps grotesque injustice. The Akedah goes well beyond a judgment of injustice, for unlike Hagar's expulsion, there is no explanation, Sarah's jealousy, or promise that she and her son Ishmael will in fact be taken care of and even eventually prosper. The Akeda is simply a demand for submission, with no explanation demanded or given. What is the meaning of faith, whether religious or secular constitutional, in a sovereign that is no longer assumed to be absolutely just? One might, of course, simply forego any independent inquiry about justice by proclaiming that justice is simply whatever the sovereign authority says it is, period, end of discussion. Perhaps that is the grim meaning of Job, though frankly it seems far easier to view God as simply terrorizing Job in order to test his bet with Satan about Job's willingness when placed under sufficient pressure to renounce God. Job, of course, does not, but frankly, does that make any sense in terms that ordinary people can understand? Perhaps the most moving image in the Torah is Abraham contending with God over the justice of destroying Sodom. But of course, that is not the portion that we are asked to contemplate on Rosh Hashanah. Instead, we are given two portions that are quintessentially about submission to divine will and the suspension of ordinary ethical judgment. My teaching as a professor of constitutional law increasingly focuses on the meaning of the word sovereignty. 
One case I find especially fascinating is an 1810 examination of the propriety of estates violating certain contractual rights of private parties. I find most interesting the beginning of a concurring opinion in that uh, c case in which Justice Johnson does, quote, not hesitate to declare that a state does not possess the power of revoking its own grants. But he writes his own separate opinion because he bases that conclusion, quote, on a general principle, on the reason and nature of things, a principle which will impose laws even on the deity, unquote. This is obviously a remarkable statement, though it is scarcely unprecedented. It is, after all, the basis of Plato's famous discussion in the Euthyphro, which addressed the relationship of piety to conceptions of the divine, and in particular, whether one could evaluate the divine authority by reference to independent norms of morality, or instead, whether morality or justice just are whatever occurs to a divinity to command. A reality of American constitutionalism is that its dominant strands have gone in a distinctly positivistic direction, where the principal inquiry is the presence of a legal command and not the independent justice of that command. Justice Johnson was writing a concurrence only for himself, and I think it's fair to say that he does not represent the dominant tradition of American constitutional law. Uh, much more representative is the distinction drawn, not at all coincidentally in a case involving slavery by Chief Justice John Marshall, between the duties of the jurist and the duties of the moralist. And as I always tell my students, if a judge in an opinion generates the binary opposition of being a jurist or a moralist, you know where the judge is coming out. Um, and that is exactly uh, where Marshall did come out. Then, uh, several years later, Chief Justice Roger Taney wrote in Dred Scott that it is not a, a, the most notorious case involving the upholding of America's a slaveholders' republic. Um, it is not the province of the court to decide upon the justice or injustice of these laws. Uh, one might hope that law will be congruent with justice or morality, but that is not the job of the judge to decide about congruence or to take on the uh, role of the moralist should there be any conflict. He went on to say the decision as to what law requires, what law requires uh, belongs to the political or law-making power to those who formed the sovereignty and framed the Constitution. The duty of the court is to interpret the instrument they have framed with the best lights we can obtain on the subject and to administer it as we find it according to its true intent and meaning when it was adopted." Unquote. For those who reject the identity of law with morality, it is, it is the judge's duty to give precedence to the law. Now, I've already suggested that I regard it as an open question why anybody should enunciate the kind of Barbara Jordan faith in Chief Justice Taney's version of the Constitution, uh, and for that matter, pledge always to be attached to the principles of the Constitution unless one adopts a theory of the Constitution which ultimately reduces the principle to the position that through amendment we can get to an idealized form of the political order so that the deep principles of the Constitution are never the actual law at any given moment, such as the law that protects slavery. That's a matter for an independent um, lecture and debate. But even if I ask my students to wrestle with such questions about interpreting and becoming loyal to uh, our foundational national document, I have also had occasion to be reminded of the centrality of sovereignty to the Jewish liturgy. 
I've already mentioned the Rosh Hashanah service. Um, um, it, it certainly is relevant that a great deal of that service includes what uh, are called sovereignty um, uh, verses, um, and one way of interpreting the Shema, uh, which is said, as all of you know, seven times to conclude the Yom Kippur service, is the acknowledgement of sovereignty to the one God, not only that there is one God, but presumably a certain entitlement to command is linked to that oneness. Um, now, the most obvious question raised by the Shema it easily disappears if one simply affirms an atheistic creed, there exists no God who can claim to be sovereign. Indeed, even agnostics must believe that we lack the epistemological resources to know what God might command. Um, but if, of course, um, one has a more robust notion of understanding uh, God's commands, um, then uh, presumably there is you know, thought to be a duty to um, um, obey them. Uh, and thus you get into the questions raised by the Akedah, where there was certainly no doubt on the part of Abraham what the command was what the commands were. Now, turning back to the state, one might very well describe one aspect of the state project as self-consciously idolatrous inasmuch as it tries to transfer to itself and to manufacture through education, ritual, and other practices the unconditional commitments formally pledged to a divinity. Yet, of course, at least as long as the world does not become wholly secular, the problem of what American constitutional theorists call dual sovereignty remains. Dual sovereignty, simply put, arises when two separate entities make claims for obedience to a given individual. The usual way that dual sovereignty arises within American constitutionalism is the role of the national government and state governments and to what extent state governments continue to have elements of sovereignty protected against the national government, an issue that is of great interest even this week. For the remainder of my remarks, I'm not interested in the federalism debate, uh, except, one might say, a federalism debate at a much, much higher metaphysical level. Um, uh, that is... Uh, if one believes that there is indeed a divine realm presided over by a God who issues commands that can be known, at the same time one lives within a state that makes its own claim to sovereign authority and to obedience. So recently the New York Times placed on its front page a story about a town clerk in upstate New York who refused to provide a marriage license to a lesbian couple. Quote, God doesn't want me to do this, unquote. So she asserted, quote, so I can't do what God doesn't want me to do, just like I can't steal or any of the other things that God doesn't want me to do, unquote. Well, how precisely ought one respond to such a claim? Does one say, this is a misunderstanding of what God actually wants believers to do? Given that the clerk in question is a self-described Bible-believing Christian, perhaps the response is to quote chapter 13 from St. Paul's letter to the Romans where he says, Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. Unquote. So if that is your view of the state and of the magistrates of the state, then presumably your duty, you, you exemplify your fidelity to God precisely by being faithful to the magistrates who tell you to do sometimes surprising things, but as we all know, the ways of God are sometimes quite strange. And the one thing you know from uh, St. Paul is that the magistrates do have some kind of divine sanction. So that, quote, whoever rebels against the authorities, rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves, unquote. Now, I suppose one might quibble about whether a low-level bureaucrat 
like the town clerk, can claim to be one of the governing authorities, or instead whether she is enjoined by Paul to accept her subordinate position in a distinct hierarchy whose basic rules are to be set by legislatures and governors, with constitutional questions presumptively to be settled by judicial authorities. Within Judaism, perhaps, one could cite the principle Dina de Mahuta Dina, the law of the land is binding, even if arguably it violates at least certain religious norms, short, of course, of renouncing God. Whatever else might explain such arguments, whether drawn from Paul or the Talmud, one might believe that it is certainly advisable from a prudential basis for members of religious communities governed by political authorities who do not share their faith commitments to assure those authorities that they are not sectarians who will defy or even worse seek to overthrow the regime in power. God may be sovereign, but apparently the sovereignty is shared with earthly political authorities who are in no way willing to recognize a divine competitor. It would be dangerous to claim otherwise, at least in public. But I take it that all of us believe that there must be some limits to political authority, even if we might disagree on the sources of such limitations. If we are religious or even secularist sympathetic to claims of religious free exercise, perhaps we will be reluctant to accept the complete swallowing up of divine sovereignty in submission to earthly authority. Within the American legal community, this issue has, for better and for worse, been explored with regard to the nomination of Roman Catholics to the United States Supreme Court. Why Roman Catholics? Because the United States is not only a basically Christian country in origins, but is very definitely a Protestant country with deep suspicions of papists who are thought to be in thrall to the Pope in Rome. So, therefore, when William Brennan was nominated to the Supreme Court in 1956, he was asked, would you, quote, be able to follow the requirements of your oath to the Constitution, or would you be bound by religious obligations, unquote. Brennan's answer was as follows, quote, what shall control me is the oath that I took to support the Constitution and the laws of the United States, and so act upon the case that come before me for decision that it is that oath and that alone which governs." Unquote. Some 30 years later, as he was preparing to retire, in an interview with a former law clerk, he was asked if he had ever had difficulty dealing with his own religious beliefs, and Brennan's response that he had had in 1956, quote, settled in my mind that I had an obligation under the Constitution which could not be influenced by any of my religious principles. So what do we think of Brennan's answer? Uh, a good friend of mine, who not at all coincidentally uh, spent much of his teaching career at Notre Dame, uh, described this as idolatry. Um, that it does not make sense, frankly, if one does recognize, if, if one professes belief in certain um, um, uh, Catholic theology, blithely to subordinate the demands not only of the church, but the church which of course claims to be the rock through which uh, God speaks, uh, to subordinate those demands. So let me give you another example. Justice Antonin Scalia, in a speech titled God's Justice and Ours, about his view of the relationship between his Catholicism and his conception of judging, particularly with regard to the death penalty. Scalia agrees with one of his colleagues that Supreme Court justices are part of, quote, the machinery of death, unquote. But unlike the colleague, Scalia believes that the Constitution clearly countenances capital punishment. Any declaration to the contrary would be unfaithful to the Constitution he is pledged to interpret faithfully. Thus Scalia wrote, quote, It is a matter of great consequence to me whether the death penalty is morally acceptable. As a Roman Catholic and being unable to jump out of skin, I cannot discuss that issue without reference to the Christian tradition and the church's magisterium. 
unquote. Now, as it turns out, he comes to the conclusion that although the Catholic Church has indicated its opposition to capital punishment, that is not, in fact, a tenet of the contemporary Catholic Church, unlike, say, the condemnation of abortion. Uh, so that he simply disagreed, from Scalia's perspective, he simply disagreeing um, with certain Catholic theo theologians rather than defying uh, the teachings of the Church. What he says is that if the prohibition of capital punishment had become an authoritative teaching of the Church that he is bound to accept as a faithful member of the Roman Catholic faith community, that he would feel it incumbent to resign because he could no longer be faithful to his other oath, but a distinctly subordinate oath to um, uh, be faithful to the United States Constitution. For his pains, Justice Scalia was denounced by Princeton historian Sean Wilentz. Scalia had criticized, quote, the tendency of democracy to obscure the divine authority behind government, unquote. Wilentz responded that Scalia's view has no, quote, no appreciable place in our constitutional history because the framers rejected it. They had an idea that sovereignty rested in a free people, unquote. You will not be surprised to know that I much prefer Justice Brennan to Justice Scalia as a faithful interpreter of the United States Constitution. I confess that I find it difficult to, to find Brennan's arguments as intellectually admirable or perhaps even coherent as Justice Scalia's comments. That is, if Justice Brennan is professing to be a truly serious member of the Roman Catholic faith community. Um, there's no reason he should be. Uh, I'm not. <laughs> um, but his self-presentation was that he was within that community, and it does seem to me that the questions are serious questions. Now, there have been eight Jewish justices on the United States Supreme Court. Quite remarkably, the current United States Supreme Court consists of six Roman Catholics and three Jews. Um, the difference between them, I would suggest in all due respect, is that none of the Jewish justices, it, either now or in the past, has been so observant that one could ask truly serious questions about the conflict between their membership in a Jewish faith community uh, and their membership in the community um, uh, of enforcing the American Constitution. Um, um, those interested, those of us interested in comparative constitutional law are well aware, incidentally, that at least some national constitutions solve the tension by proudly proclaiming their embeddedness within a given religious tradition. This can be done in a quite subtle way, as through the Greek constitutions being presented, quote, in the name of the holy and consubstantial and indivisible trinity, or the much more spelled out uh, Saudi Arabian and Pakistani constitutions, which define themselves as Islamic states under um, the Koran. Uh, now, quite obviously, I don't have to spell out the debates uh, within Israel about what it means to call Israel a Jewish state uh, and what the relationship is between a Jewish state and um, the, um, the, um, the commands, the observances that are thought by some at least to instantiate the practice of Judaism. Um, let me conclude by turning to a very, very interesting book called Constitutions by Consensus. Some of you may be familiar with this. Published in Israel in 2007, in the aftermath of over two years of intense meetings and debates among a group of diverse Israelis, 
about what form a written constitution for Israel might take, especially given the insistence by almost all contemporary Israeli Jews that Israel does have a joint identity as both a democratic and a Jewish state. The central theme of this book was that if Israel is ever to join the overwhelming number of countries in the world with canonical written constitutions and not simply stop with the so-called constitutional revolution of 1992 that is under severe attack in this country, especially insofar as, as it is thought to bolster judicial authority, that if it is ever to have a constitution of settlement, then compromise will be an integral element of resolving what this group called the existential need in Israel now. The first part of the book, for me, is the most interesting. The second part lays out suggestions for what a constitution might look like. They're interesting. But the most important, the most interesting part for me was the first part, the set of essays titled, I Believe, in which the participants are uh, drawn from both the secular and religious Jewish communities. There were no Arabs in this group, um, uh, which, which certainly is not insignificant. Uh, but there was, of course, great disagreement, which is worth attending to, even within the Jewish participants. Not surprisingly, the word compromise reappears often in the various statements and in the final collective statement acknowledging that necessary, quote, compromises and concessions will be painful, unquote, in order to achieve the goal. Well, what is behind this? What kinds of compromises might we, or what situation, really, are they responding to? Go back to 1948, when ostensibly the Knesset was supposed to draft the Constitution, and of course it didn't. Two comments that helped to explain why there was no Constitution. One, quote, the Jewish people, this is the Israeli Minister of Welfare, quote, the Jewish people are willing to resign themselves to many things, said Yitzhak Mirelevi. But the moment the issue touches upon the foundations of their faith, they are unable to compromise. If you wish to foist upon us this type of life or a constitution that will be contrary to the laws of the Torah, we will not accept it. Unquote. Another speaker um, offering very similar comment um, described the call for compromise as in fact a call for a Kulturkampf and said this is not a convenient time for a thorough and penetrating examination of our essence and purpose uh, inasmuch as there is no room for any compromise, any concessions or mutual agreements since no man can compromise and concede on issues upon which his belief and soul depend." Unquote. So we're now almost 70 years later and the question is whether we've gotten any closer, or you have gotten, I don't live in Israel, uh, whether Israel has gotten any closer to being able to have a fully candid discussion, not between Jews and Arabs, uh, because there the issue of compromise, uh, at least if there are secularists on both sides, is one of political arrangements. It is not um, based on um, divine duties that can't be sacrificed. So what does it mean to engage in compromise when one does feel oneself under the lash of a divine sovereign who takes precedent over other kinds of sovereigns. How does one solve this sort of dilemma? Uh, quite frankly, I have no uh, solution. There is no happy ending to this talk. It is a problem, um, but it does seem to me, I mean, one would hand cite certain passages uh, from the Talmud and others about the, the ways of the Talmud are the ways of peace. We all know uh, that one can uh, uh, deny the Shabbat in order to save a life. 
um, so that there are resources available. But nonetheless, the basic uh, political issue is when people feel themselves bound by a higher order sovereign who issues knowable commands that they cannot renounce against the commands of a state, um, um, made, if it's a secular state, made without any uh, attention at all to religious duties, or even if it professes to be perhaps a kind of religious state, it still has a different view of the religion from the sectarians who are quite confident that they know what God commands. This problem of dual sovereignty, I think, um, is an absolutely um, uh, central reality in Israel, but of course in the United States as well. Uh, the, the upstate um, New Yorker might be a minor official, but unfortunately she's not unique. Um, and this, I think, continues. The, the, the commitment to divine sovereignty, contrary to what some thought, we've been talking about this in our conference, has not gone away. The Enlightenment is not sweeping notions of religious sovereignty before it, and we still have to contend with this crucial issue of dual sovereignty. So I feel a little bit like I'm returning to the scene uh, of an earlier crime. <laughs> so I'm probably going to say just a few words about that. Um, Sandy is in some sense my target. And in some sense, Sandy was my target um, so long ago, and it actually got me invited to Hartman. So <laughs> um, in, uh, arguments like Sandy's, which I think are really very, very crucial about the um, kind of parallel structure of Torah and Constitution were the subject of an article that I published, uh, which might have been sort of entitled The Uses and Abuses of Jewish Law in American Constitutional Legal Theory. Uh, and that article, right, it wasn't titled that. I was more circumspect then. Right? I didn't say uses and abuses directly. Uh, but uh, that article got me invited here, so I think for a process of retraining in some way. So you're going to have to judge tonight whether the process of retraining took hold. So I, I think what Sandy has really very elegantly done in the kind of um, way in which Sandy has of wonderfully combining both the um, propositional with history, right, with you know lived examples from history, uh, is to walk us through a diverse set of examples of dual sovereignty. Right. So let me just put four on the table that he's actually really touched on in a, in a kind of serious way. One of them is constitutional supremacy and independent morality. And the example, the, the kind of quintessential example that we have in uh, American legal history is the dilemma of slavery and rights of resistance. The second, divine sovereignty and independent morality, exemplified by the Akeda. Right? As with slavery, must one submit to positive law or is independent morality a sufficient basis for resisting, in essence, right? in some way, the divine legislator? Third, religious authority and human political authority. Right? So, Justices Brennan, Justice Scalia, and the example of the town clerk. Right? How do religious citizens in the modern state actually experience right, their dilemmas of what Sandy has called divided loyalty. What do they do when they see, right, when they feel that their religious precepts might in some way, right, come into conflict with state law and their duties as that clerk or judge to actually enforce that law, not ordinary citizens in that sense. And finally, Sandy gestures to a fourth example, which I'll return to at the end. And I think that fourth example, 
right, is essentially Israel as a Jewish and democratic state. Right? So, and I think the most important, but one very important, not the most important, but one very important aspect to get out of Sandy's talk tonight is just this, the structural recursions. Right? This is one very important, just to see how all around us, these conflicts right, between normative orders are there, and they take the same structure. Now, some structure, right, one aspect, one important connection between these structures that Sandy is drawing has to do precisely with this notion of civil religion, and that is that we are, in fact, that one of our dilemmas comes from the fact that we keep transferring and spreading the idea of sovereignty as a kind of ultimate power, which is commanding feelings of deep loyalty, right, and even reverence from one realm to the other. So the normative conflict between the commands of God and of independent morality become replicated in the normative conflict between constitution and morality or constitution and church. Right? Part of the civil religion argument is indeed to elevate right, the constitution, to make it kind of grab us in the same way so that the problem of sovereignty isn't solely a logical problem, it's also a psychological problem. Right? The psychological problem of what it does for us at the emotional level. And I think that's, that, that to me I think is a very important part of Sandy's argument. Um, so now, Sandy here is actually being primarily, I think, descriptive, not normative, and really is saying in the end, as he put it, right, there is no way out of this, right? It exists. It's all around us. At the same time, uh, you know, unless we, of course, just selected one side of the equation and gave it complete primacy without more. At the same time, I do believe that he is reading between the lines. I do believe that he is suggesting that it does need management and not just living in the conflict, right? Not just stasis. So one way of managing, of course, is in fact to reconceive sovereignty, right? As something a little less than this absolute exclusive package, right? Uh, so we could talk about, for example, divided sovereignty. Federalism is actually, you know, in some sense could be seen as an example of that rather than dual sovereignty. That is, it's, in, it's certainly in later pictures. The absolute aspect of the normative conflict is softened because the very idea of sovereignty as necessarily exclusive is replaced by a notion of sovereignty, right, as in some sense shared, plural, naturally so. Sometimes this is by putting it in different spheres and departments. We can manage it that way. Um, and I do think that in here, civil religion has been a very important part of kind of shaping this notion. That is, we do think about the relationship of the Bible to conceptions of sovereignty, and we think particularly about pictures of God. This has been an argument that has been made, I think, when I began to start thinking a little bit about sovereignty. It was in the heyday of feminist jurisprudence. And one of the arguments that was very prominently on the table in the heyday of feminist jurisprudence, that it was particularly the biblical God, right? The, the, the jealous God and exclusive God, the monotheist God, Right? that really was at the bottom of a certain very deep conception right, of absolute exclusive sovereignty, the centralized state, right? and also right, the centralized authoritative sort of hierarchical notion of even the family. And at that time, you could hear and see arguments that polytheism right, was in many ways a better model because it would put immediately on the table Right? This notion of more diffuse conception of shared sovereignty, plural sovereignty, etc. Uh, and you know, even recently, Mark Leela's claim, if we remember it, right, that the picture of the triune God right, was somehow involved in the story of the ability of Christianity in the West to divide sovereignty between church and state. Now, of course, often the relationship is really the reverse. That is, political thinkers who are invested in either a centralized or a federated system go back and they read the Hebrew 
the Bible, they reread theology, and then they come up with some or another sort of notion of a picture of uh, what it was to support the new event. So we can think, for example, of right political Hebraists who looked at when it comes to conflicts between divine command and independent reason. And here I want to um, maybe um, highlight at least how I read Sandy a little, since we're also since we're not only talking normatively but also you know, in a sense, emotionally and psychologically. I think Sandy, uh, for purposes of this argument, but maybe altogether here, is uh, sharpening our problem by invoking um, a particular model, right, a particular picture of God uh, that is uh, reminiscent to me, it kind of echoes a little bit with the way in which uh, we might think of the theology of Yeshayahu Leibovitz. That is, the emphasis on submission, on the notion of religion as theocentric, right? And in therefore, indeed, by, by, its, by, by virtue of this conception, right, of religion and of Judaism, right, and of a kind of very transcendent God uh, creating and um, kind of jiggering up the problem of the conflict of dual sovereignty or of the clash of normative orders. So that independent morality right, and religious obligation right, become very, very tense, conflicting realms right, in this thought. But then I think about the agotic picture of God, which is a much more imminent picture of God, and it seems to you know, sort of, or primarily I got a picture, the picture of the learning God, right? The one who learns justice from Abraham or who learns justice from Moses, indeed rewrites parts of the Torah because Moses teaches him about justice. And that picture is quite a different picture that also, that, right, that goes along with techniques of management because it goes along in a very strong way with one technique of management of one of these dual sovereignty conflicts, and that is moral interpretation. But equally important in Judaism is not just pictures of God, it's pictures of the law. And it seems to me that how one understands and depicts the law becomes a rather central aspect here. It isn't only the question of theology. And one very important question is, do you picture the halakha? Do you picture it as this comprehensive system. Do you see it as a single sacral framework, utterly comprehensive, intended to govern every aspect of life? I know we talk about that a lot, but the question is whether that really is the picture at all times, or does it contain gaps, right? Does it contain gaps? Does it see itself in some way as making room for plural, right, plural laws? And one way in which we have indeed achieved a certain resolution with the state is precisely because there have been openings in which the halakha has seen a gap, uh, or it has seen a kind of permission to incorporate other laws into it. And we might see Dina Demolchada, Dina, which Sandy talked about a little bit, is, is in some way moving towards that. Now, there's something about that that's an interesting technique of management, and it points to something psychological that I, because Sandy has put that on the table, that I want to stress. And that is the differing perspectives that generally are involved when we deal with the question of dual sovereignty. Most often, conflicts of dual sovereignty actually um, get resolved because both parties believe that they are in some sense the winners. That is, both parties tend to tell a story in which they are the sovereign, but they as the sovereign have found space inside themselves, right, for subordinate authority, right? So in the Constitution, the religion clauses manage it. In the end, it's the Constitution that has its final say. Uh, within Judaism, we have doctrines like Dina Demachet Adina, or even if we think about something that we as a group will do tomorrow, like some of the gestures in Rabbi Nissim Garandi towards incorporating uh, kind of side by side with the Sanhedrin, the power of the king, but there's always, these are not cases of strong pluralism or of deep normative conflict. There are always cases in which 
there's some layer on top that has authorized this, right, which create, which continues the question of sovereignty. And both parties engage in that, and both parties win in the end. So dual sovereignty in that way can be managed quite often through not sharing the same perspective, just allowing oneself not to share the same perspective. Uh, finally, there are two other possibilities, and this gets me to Israel as a Jewish and democratic state. One um, possibility that I want to talk about is really Sandy here um, has put in front of us the question whether dual sovereignty really is something we should just live with, accept, or whether, and I, here is how I read him in the end, and I'd, I'd kind of like to hear from him in the end, whether there's one other way of managing. And that way of managing is compromise, painful compromise. Right? And Sandy concludes with this notion of painful compromise. Uh, he's talking here not about Jewish and democratic in the sense that we often understand it in the Declaration of Independence as Jewish, you know, Jewish is a conception that is not necessarily a religious conception, but rather to make this a more, but rather in, in, in the context of the current social sit setting. The current social setting does in fact mean that what we're talking about is a kind of conflict between religion right, and, um, and the state. And, and here, I think, there's something that gets me back to the beginning here. So Sandy quotes in his paper, and I'm not sure he quoted it tonight, Obama's you know, sort of moving example of saying, look, you know, you need to compromise, right? In essence, you can't throw the baby out with the bathwater. In the end of the day, right, the uh, position of principle is painful compromise. Now, I didn't hear tonight, and I didn't see in the paper, any quotes from a religious leader who got up and said, yes, I'm compromising my religious principles. Okay, so this, I mean, I think we have in some way reached the limits of the analogy of Torah and constitution and religion and politics. None of us today, I think, will imagine Right, the, chief, the current chief rabbi or the shock or any figure that we want to pick, getting up and saying, I am compromising my religious principles for the sake of the state. That doesn't mean the compromise doesn't happen. And what we need to have a much better idea of is how we can avoid putting, expecting something like that. Right? How can we avoid that and what are the conditions Right, that could in fact lead to compromise, but even more so, right, compromise in the sense of saying, in the sense of self-interest, because something better is achieved from the religious point of view, that sometimes happens, uh, so, or that compromise is not really compromise, but rather uh, something productive, like reconciliation. But I think what we really should not slight is the managerial techniques. Those managerial techniques actually themselves, I think, have been largely abandoned of late. Right? Reinterpretation, the project of somebody like Rabbi Herzog to in some sense update, uh, try, try to reinterpret halakha and democracy in some way together. These, this, this project was a deeply crucial, important, vibrant, energetic project. And I sense, at least, and I hope I'm wrong, that the entire project has kind of waned and disappeared. And that, I think, is a very, very sad, if true, a sad turn of events that we should fight. Thank you. Well, thank you very much both of our speakers. We have about 20 minutes now uh, for questions and comments from the floor. And I have just two requests. Number one, uh, please identify yourselves briefly, however you'd like, before you start speaking. And number two, whether it's a question or a comment, make it as brief as possible in deference to others who may want to comment or question. So who wants to break the ice? And I wish the conflict had. Thank you. 
taken into account the horrific conflict that was faced in Nazi Germany, number one, or when citing biblical examples of this conflict, why, if you will, more enlightening examples, like, for example, the Hebrew midwives in Exodus, who were caught between the laws of their state and their king and their god, Pharaoh, and, if you will, a higher authority, our God. Yeah, I have no doubt that there are lots and lots of examples um, that, you know, that would be attractive from our particular points of view. I, mean, I, I, I don't know that there is much conflict between what Suzanne said and, and what I said. Um, I mean, one of the reasons the Hartman Institute was so compelling to me for my initial encounter was the project of reinterpreting the materials by people infinitely more knowledgeable than I am or, or could ever be in ways that struck me as very attractive with regard to a vision of not only the state of Israel, but you know, Jewry around the world. But you know, it's been 26 years and the Messiah hasn't come. <laughs> and the reality is, in all seriousness, if you're talking about the state of Israel, uh, the Haredi are more prominent than was the case 26 years ago. And if one looks at the United States, uh, the role of fundamentalist religion, right-wing religion, whatever one wants to call it, is far more powerful than anybody would have imagined 25 years ago. And so those are the, the existential realities, if you will, that I think we have to contend with and try to figure out what a managerial solution might look like um, as against the possibility of, you know, a very bleak future. Um, um, you know, it doesn't have to be civil war in order to be more and more contentious with the possibility of compromise being viewed as an invitation to sell your soul. Please wait until the microphone reaches you so everybody can hear what you have to say. Uh, Stanley Wagner. Um, first of all, the con concept of compromise does exist within Judaism, even within the legal system. It's called Pshara. And it's based on a verse which uh, uh, reconciles ha-emet ve ha-shalom ehavu. That's loving both truth and peace. So if you are committed to the two values of truth and peace, then you can forge uh, a compromise. So, so that, that exists already within the framework of Jewish law. Uh, but what I wanted to also uh, say is that I think that's the the, the most significant dual sovereignty that exists is the is is the is the one between the ones we called it uh, independent morality, but if you call it autonomy, I think you would be closer to the concept of sovereignty because when a person commits himself to the sovereignty of those ideals which shape his life, whatever those values are, that he, he is committed to them, even as uh, the Orthodox Jew is committed uh, to Torah values. He's committed to the values which he has embraced and accepted, the, and, and, and regards his autonomy uh, as, as, as important as the submission that the Orthodox Jew does. So those are the two, those are the two polarities uh, that we have in terms of dual sovereignty, which uh, since the, the Constitution is interpreted by people with values, the autonomous values which they have, or the religious values that they possess. Even, even
if one could be used, uh, I think, justifiably in interpreting any kind of document. Thank you. I, I agree with you just very quickly. On the first point, you're absolutely right. Again, you know, there are all sorts of materials within the tradition that the Hartman Institute has taught me. They clearly didn't persuade the Minister of Welfare in 1948. And so the practical question is, what do you do with people who cite other materials which are you know, run in a different direction? On the second point, and this could be the subject not only of a separate talk but of a separate conference, you're really raising the issue of conscience. You're really talking about conscience. And I think the all-important difference between Kantian arguments on individual autonomy and the religious arguments that I find most interesting is that the claim of the religious argument is that there is a sovereign above who is commanding me and, under the most dramatic versions, will send me to an eternity in hell if I don't remain faithful Whereas secular arguments of conscience, however much we might be sympathetic to them, have an entirely different structure. There is no external authority making command, and there are no consequences, there are no punishment consequences other than your own feeling of guilt for violating your autonomous morality. There's a gentleman over here. Thank you. My name is Jeremiah Unterman. I'm uh, uh, in term of I don't know exactly why Israel necessarily needs a constitution. England doesn't have one. Eh, it seems to be muddling along. Okay. I think that the key aspect in any case, I mean, the key relevance of a constitution is that it leads to laws, hopefully just laws, which you know, get translated into society. Now, if the legal system can exist in uh, terms of creating just laws, as it were, which without a constitution, then maybe it's, in the case of Israel, it may be better not to have a constitution because of the issues mentioned. Also, the other, briefly, uh, is that I was a little bit surprised by your examples about Hagar and the Akeda. It's like if you're taking a case and you're only reading the first three sentences about the case. All right? With Hagar, she ends up and not only protected by the same God who wanted her out or agreed to let, to let her get out, but her son even becomes uh, not just protected, but is given all kinds of princely, literal, literally princely attributes. Uh, and in terms of the Akeda, again, that too is not carried out in reality. In reality, Isaac is saved by another command of God. In other words, apparently, yes, it's a a very uncomfortable test of faith, shall we say, but maybe the ultimate message is that God will never demand that uh, you actually have to go through with sacrificing your child. So, if you want to take a, I think a more, a better example for your purposes, you might want to take a Malik, okay, or maybe the seven nations, okay. And even there, you know, that's no longer uh, applicable, and then the question really becomes, I mean, you're right, though, that there is an ethic independent, apparently, of God in the Torah. Otherwise, Abraham could not have asked, shall not the judge of all the earth do justice? Uh, and there would be all those comments in the Torah about God being good, and in the prophets also. So, um, it, so yes, so ethic it seems to be the highest Okay, the highest value, and that might help do away with it. But there's other issues, but... <laughs> the second point, I expect we just don't have enough time to have a full discussion. Points are obviously very interesting. On the first, um, I think it's debatable to say any longer that the United Kingdom doesn't have a constitution because there's so much now within Europe and the European Convention of Human Rights and the Treaty of Rome system. I mean, they're taken almost literally every day to one or another of the European courts. Um, New Zealand is, you know, is your example. And the question 
is if you have a homogeneous society where norms, there, there's a wide consensus on social norms, do you need a constitution? No, probably not. Uh, but the real question is what if you have what an Israeli political scientist, Hannah Lerner, describes as a highly divided society. One of the things that constitutes a highly divided society, uh, she's talking about Israel, Ireland, and India, the three I's, and the constitution, constitutional formation, is that you can't rely on the pre-existing we're all in this together consensus. And what can be useful about a constitution is what I call the constitution of settlement, which will make certain ground rules clear rather than allow people to you know, constantly change the rules in the middle of the game in order to serve their own political interests. But I certainly don't believe that constitutions are a necessity for every particular country, um, but it does seem to me that Israel arguably has paid some cost for relying on good faith and homogeneity rather than what you might be able to get from a constitution. But, you know, reasonable people can certainly disagree on that. No, jump in. No, I think the Akeda, I actually wanted to go back to the Akeda for a second, because I think that's a, that was your first question, really, just because I think it is very illustrative of something in that. Um, actually, it, you know, the Akeda, and like it, already be, you could already begin to see echoes of criticism of the Akeda, I think, already in the rabbinic sources, that there was a tip, already in the rabbinic sources. Uh, so you're already beginning to see that, the, that this picture that one might get, this kind of slightly flat picture, I think, of just command of submission, is something very complicated in the, in, the, in the rabbinic imagination, certainly with other prophets, right? Other prophets, they can't just simply accept, uh, I mean, a prophecy. The idea is, you know, you better check this out if it goes against... Uh, external normal, uh, normative criteria. And eventually, that leads to commentators wondering, was there a way for Abraham to avoid this? So I think we, you know, we, it's a wonderful example of the complications of this very particular issue. I saw a hand over here, and then I'm going to head over to this side. Of the room. Yes, sir. I'm um, uh, Bill Hamilton, a rabbi in Boston. And Thank you both for the wonderful presentation. I, I really appreciated the point that was brought out about the multivocality of the tradition. I love the image because I was taught earlier this year that there is actually a rabbinic tradition that the two tablets, we assume that the two tablets of the law are five on one side and five on the other. There's actually a, a prominent rabbinic text that says that each have ten. Uh, one tablet has ten from Exodus, the other has the ten from Deuteronomy. And right there you have um, multivocality in the differences between those two. And, and again, even in the book of Numbers where we are right now, we see the divine um, accepting laws like Paso the second Passover, like the laws of inheritance for the daughters of Slovchad, um, uh, like things that get changed, right? Um, and that's part of the divine, as you've said very, very effectively. My question um, comes back to the, the whole question of, um, uh, I guess, of, of orthodox as opposed to orthoprax, this notion of right belief. Because it seems to me you raised the question about the Constitution in the United States, knowing its origin, knowing the circumstances of its certain amendments that um, were, were very hardly seemed divine <laughs> there are, in the way in which they, they came about. You, you, you said because of the origin, therefore it seems to suggest that we know how flawed the circumstances are and so why see them as divine. To me, it's not so much the origin, it's, it's the issue of the orthodox sort of approach, right? The orthodox right belief sort of approach, regardless of the circumstances that gave rise to them and the origin of them, um, that can simply look at it today and say, 
this is not, there's no wiggle room. There's the, the, this notion of sovereign is absolute. And that that's the, the, the core issue that I think has really been unpacked wonderfully tonight. Yeah, let me just underline one that's more case of confusion on this. Um, my own views are highly pluralistic. Um, I believe with regard to what I call the Constitution Conversation, one can get wherever one wants to go, and that may be true with even with what I'm you know, calling the Constitution of Settlement if the pressure is high enough. But the fact is what I'm really concerned about are people who, dis who disagree with me and who you know, either look to different proof texts or are more orthodox. Now, the last thing in the world I want to say, I'm arguing is that authentic Judaism is orthodox Judaism. You know, I think authentic Judaism runs across the board, including atheistic Judaism. <laughs> um, but if one is trying to talk you know, politically, how does one bring peace in a world that includes this array of people who don't accept your arguments, then what next? Especially if their arguments... I don't make my arguments on the basis of divine command. Uh, I view myself as a secular Jew. But how do I respond to people who say, you're a secular Jew, and I, you know, I know what God wants? Um, and you know, I say, well, have you read this text and this text? And they will say, well, yes, I have. But <laughs> that still doesn't change my view as to what I think God wants. I'm going to take the two questions that I saw over here as the last two questions. Thank you very much to both of you. Um, the problem of dual sovereignty is very pressing and very evident in Israel at the moment um, in the arena of the military. Um, the character of the military and just one small example is the issue of women and religion in the military. And what I want to hear from you is whether you have any suggestions about uh, to address this issue, especially uh, with an emphasis on the specific character of the military, the fact that it's an organ of the state, the fact that it has an end that is most pressing, uh, perhaps related to pikuach uh, nefesh, collectively, um, and uh, the fact that there's a, a professional element to it, that when you enter it, you're no longer just a private person. Thank you. I wish I thought I had something useful to say. Um, I don't. I very much was interested Monday morning um, in listening to uh, uh, Dan Meridor, uh, whom I was very much impressed by, I have to say. You, know, you can tell me whether I was right or not to be impressed by him, but I was. And this he brought up, and he brought it up from, I think it's fair to say, distinctly liberal direction that I share. Um, but the political issue is what about the people who don't share a liberal vision? Um, what compromises, if any, are we willing to make with them? And, you know, it's not simply not for me to make suggestions I don't live here. I often am more than willing to give advice to the Israeli government. It's just that I really have not thought this through in any way that would allow me, you know, even with professorial arrogance, to say, well, here's what you ought to do. <laughs> the gentleman in the baseball cap gets the last question. Uh, Jack Berger from Chicago. Uh, it's difficult to talk about the Akidah when you're just throwing out certain little facets of it, but I think it's important for you to understand that Rashi believed that Abraham did not understand the command, number one. And number two, the Rashban also talked about the fact that after these things, God tested Abraham, and therefore, what were those things? But I won't go into my sermon. Uh, several weeks ago, we had a thing called Shalach Lecha, in which there were 12 spies. Ten came back with a rather inglorious report, and two did. Two thought that the land was pretty cool. <laughs> 
God sided with the two. What I'm perplexed with is this constant love affair with the issue of democracy. Uh, Eighty years ago, a fellow with a funny mustache uh, was elected in Germany. That didn't work out so well. A few days ago, or maybe it was yesterday, uh, we had a democratic election supposedly in Egypt. Everyone a number of months ago said the Muslim Brotherhood will never win. It shows you what the pundits know. There's nothing in the Torah that talks about a democratic issue that relates to what we're talking about here today. So my question is, where did this love affair, certainly in the judiciary of Israel, there's no democracy. These are all appointed by cronies after crony after crony. So where does democracy come in in a modern Jewish state? I mean, kind of the flip answer is the separation of dependence and the, um, the ideological commitment of the state itself to being a democratic state. Um, again, it would be the topic for a separate conference on what one means by democracy, whether democracy is necessarily a good thing, and you know, I think we could talk about that at length. Um, you know, with regard to Descartes, one, one more point. One of the first books I think I read after my introduction to the Mahon was Sean Spiegel's The Last Trial, um, which I, you know, I still think is one of the great books I've ever read. And you know, one of the things that, of course, is he you know, points one's attention to is that Isaac doesn't come down from the mountain. You know, where is he? <laughs> and among other things, you get a sense of how easily Judaism could have become a version of Christianity if you viewed the sacrifice having gone through and Isaac becomes the central cult figure for having accepted his sacrifice to sanctify God and then returns three years later after the death of his mother in grief. But it didn't work out that way, obviously. Um, I know there are ways of making the Akedai more gentle, but it still seems to me, you know, terrorism of Isaac plus this inexplicable... I mean, Abraham has to explain to Sarah presumably what he's doing. And one would be interested in that conversation. <laughs> And, yes, uh, but that I think scarcely counts as a happy ending <laughs> to this, this episode. And quite frankly, I'd be more willing to accept the happy ending version of the Hagar story if Jews and Arabs had learned to live in peace as the two great Abrahamic nations, but it hasn't worked out that way either. Um, and so for me, it, it's still a, a tragedy. Um, um, and, you know, and one can understand why, I mean, there are all sorts of apologetics as to why slavery, a constitution with slavery was better than a constitution with no slavery, because there would have been no constitution at all. The United States would not have risen and prospered, and the whole world would have been worse off so that, you know, life is tragic and there are times to engage in what Avishai calls rotten compromises. And he doesn't say there aren't. He doesn't say that there's never an occasion to engage in rotten compromise. It was a good thing for the United States to ally with Joseph Stalin in World War II. But then he says we didn't have to compromise with Stalin at Yalta the way we did because we had won the war. And, you know, it was a pact with the devil. And when it's no longer necessary to use the devil, then you should pull back. Um, but, you know, the, these, I think, are what make politics so anguishing. It makes compromise so anguishing. One very last point. There's a new book just published by two friends called The Spirit of Compromise. Uh, Amy Gutman and Dennis Thompson 
And the most striking thing about their book is that they say you can't expect compromises to meet philosophical tests of principle because two sides committed to quite different philosophies will, for whatever reason, feel it incumbent to enter into an agreement. But it's not because either has persuaded the other that they're wrong on some fundamental notion. Slavery really isn't so bad as I thought it was, so, you know, so why not give you the three-fifths clause? Or, you know, but rather you, you say, all things considered, you and maybe even the world will be better off if you make these rotten compromises or even just terrible compromises than if not, but there's still really gut-wrenching compromises. Well, uh, I have restrained myself for an hour and 42 minutes, and I do not <laughs> intend to breach that norm right now. So please join me in thanking our splendid presenters.